Yo, what's up? Dr. Swole here, MD, pro physique athlete, back with another podcast episode on Swole Radio. And we have Eric Helms back on the show. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Always a pleasure. How many times have I been on now? Have you kept yeah, back? I have to count. I mean, many. He is a staple on Swole Radio and a big influence on the channel. And today we're going to be catching up on leg training. So this is part two of our muscle group training series. The last one, we covered the upper body. And at this point, people, including Eric, are probably thinking, Bill's this bro who never trains legs. And today we're going to set that to rest because we're going to be talking all about the legs. So quads, hamstrings, glutes, calves, everything. And giving you guys some pro tips on exercise selection, technique, and some other nuanced details that are going to really bring your physique to the next level. So just jumping right into it, starting off with the quads. I think this is going to be a fun one to talk about. Yeah, man. Quads are, I think, uh, relatively straightforward as far as, as, as what do you need to do once you, it's very straightforward once you get away from some of the kind of the common information streams and let's say less than nuanced positions that some people have. Um, so from like the functional or barbell fitness focused or strength conditioning crowd, powerlifting crowd, you'll often hear something like, you know, squats are the, the king of, of exercises or at least king of the lower body exercises or sometimes all you need for for, for leg development um, and I think squats are awesome um, but it depends on what do you define as a squat um, and I think getting aware away from some of the narrower definitions like if you mm. hang out in Olympic weightlifting crowds a squat is a you know, a front squat or a high bar back squat done the full depth and, that, and anything else is, is something you scoff at. Uh, powerlifting circles, why would you not do low bar? You can lift heavier. It's got to be to meet depth. And, and that's the only thing you need. You get into other circles, you know, like single leg squats, kettlebell squats, pistol squats, all this stuff. And ultimately, if, if we define squat as a simultaneous action of going into you know, hip and knee flexion, and then going through simultaneous hip and the extension coming back to the start, single leg or dual leg with any modality, free weight or otherwise, now you've got me on board that squats are a really great exercise. Um, but they aren't necessarily the end all be all. And I mean that literally that you don't need anything else for the lower body if your goal is to get complete development of the lower body, although they are a big staple. So, Squatting patterns is the way I like to refer to them. Um, and generally that is, like I said, anything where one or both legs is going through flexion and extension of both the knee and the hip. Um, now, if we think kind of our basic like level one anatomy course, you go, okay, so what does hip extension, what does knee extension? Okay, knee extension, easy, that's the quadriceps. Hip extension, easy, that's the glutes and the hamstrings. Right. So squats obviously train everything except the calves. Um, level two kind of anatomy. And I, I know we've talked about this before on other episodes of the podcast, but assuming that people have not listened to that, we need to understand the difference between uh, monoarticular and biarticular muscles. So a biarticular muscle simply means that it crosses, it articulates two joints. Um, and there are uh, things to consider with some of the muscle groups that are in the glutes hands and quads uh, on that front. So for example, the quadriceps foreheads, um, there are the vasti group, you got your vastus lateralis, medialis and intermedius, and you also have the rectus femoris. And the rectus femoris is relatively unique because it crosses both the hip and the knee joint. So that means when it shortens, if you think about uh, a muscle that attaches to your knee and attaches to your hip, it could not only extend your knee, but it could also flex your hip right? So why does that matter? Okay, well, if this muscle contracts, it's producing a moment or a torque, or it's producing force, the muscle action, uh, or, the, or the joint action, I should say, of doing hip flexion. Now, hold on. Do we want to be actively and concentrically flexing our hip while we're trying to extend our hip? No, that, that, that's, that's the, the opposite movement of hip extension. And in fact, what we see when we look at studies on squats is that you see very low levels of hypertrophy in specifically the rectus femoris in response to squatting, uh, if it occurs at all. Um, and I uh, think that makes sense, right? If if you're trying to do hip extension, you don't want something to, to be working against that. 
So if the rectus femoris is active, it's probably more as a stabilizing function and probably during the concentric phase of the squat, it's one head of the quadriceps, which is not active and therefore doesn't seem to grow. And that's one aspect of, of, uh, of the squat that we need to consider. But if we kind of take that same theme, oh, okay, it seems the body won't do things that are actively uh, counteracting a goal it's trying to produce, which is knee extension and hip extension. So let's then talk about the hamstrings, right? So the hamstrings, yes, we read our kind of level one anatomy textbook. They provide a, they're a synergist for hip extension. So we think they've got to be working during the squats because squats are hip extension and knee extension, but they're also knee flexors, right? So all the hamstrings are biarticular except for the short head of the biceps femoris. That means that they don't have a choice of which joint action they're performing. Whenever they shorten, they're producing both a knee flexion and a hip extension moment, right? But we're trying to extend the, extend the knee. So we don't want to be trying to flex the knee at the same time. So here again, we're seeing the kind of the same, situ, same scenario with the rectus femoris where the hamstrings aren't actually that active during a squat because they'd be counteracting the vast eye muscle group. And actually, when we look at some of these studies on the uh, hypertrophy response to squats of different depths and different studies, it's been shown multiple times, uh, we see that both the hamstrings and the rectus femoris really don't grow very effectively from squats. So now we're kind of left with, by the process of elimination, what do we got left? You know, what are the non biarticular muscles that perform hip and knee extension? And we got three of the four heads of the quadriceps, like we already discussed, all the vasti group minus the rectus femoris. Um, and we got the glutes, the other hip extensors, right? Um, but good news, you think you've lost, you know, like half of the muscles that you initially thought were performed in the squat. Well, there's also some muscles you didn't know that were contributing. So, for example, the adductor magnus, mm. that's the big, you know, medial muscle on the inside of your thigh that really does contribute a lot to the appearance of leg size, both from the front and back. Um, that is actually a very strong hip extensor, if not the strongest hip extensor, when you're in deep flexion. So when you're going through full range of motion in a squat, that ad adductor magnus is contributing quite substantially. So the, the way to really view these squat patterns if, if you're using a full range of motion is they train the vast thigh muscle group, they train the glutes, and they train the adductor magnus as the primary movers. And there's also some secondary stuff in there. There's actually a pretty decent moment around the ankle. You know, the soleus actually contributes to the upward motion of the barbell, even though it doesn't even cross the knee, you know, but that has more to do with induced acceleration rather than direct anatomical uh, function impacting the joint. But anyway, you know, the calf is, is doing a little bit, your, your lumbar muscles are doing something, uh, you're having to brace. So I can really understand people who see the squat as kind of like the quote unquote king of exercise. It is a full body movement, but it's just not that effective for hypertrophying muscles that are acting as stabilizers or just contributing through a very brief phase because they're not having kind of that quote unquote time under tension. They're probably not being engaged sufficiently at long muscle lengths. But when we look at, you know, what muscles are being engaged through a large portion of the movement at long muscle lengths, which have to contribute throughout the majority of the movement, that's where we've got our conclusion that we got the vasti, the glutes and the adductor. And that's uh, the benefit of squatting patterns. And that's kind of the anatomical perspective and then the question about, you know, what modality should we choose from squats? That comes down to overall systemic fatigue, joint mobility, injury history, um, and, you know, equipment access and personal preference. Yeah, that was great. I really like how we broke down the anatomy because, yeah, I think anatomy is just really important for bodybuilders to understand where it explains why you're doing things. And once you really understand your anatomy, where things attach and what joints they cross, you can start figuring out your own programming and not having to rely on someone else's kind of cookie cutter plan. One thing I wonder about when it comes to, you know, when people talk about squats and compound movements, if someone is say a beginner or training with relatively low volumes, if they're only say they're not, they don't have very much time, like they're only doing maybe like six to 10 sets a week, should they still be including, you know, leg extensions for hypertrophy or are they going to get more bang for the buck if they just focused on compounds? I think that depends on the context. You know, if someone is a novice with aspirations of bodybuilding and is really interested in developing a complete muscular and symmetrical physique everywhere mm -hmm. and wants to leave no stone unturned, 
I think that's a little different than someone who is new to lifting and they have goals that include aesthetic changes to their body. Mm. If you're in that second camp, I think it, the opportunity cost is probably not worth doing and, and finding isolated knee extension and knee flexion mo movements. Mm -hmm. um, and you're probably better served, you know, getting those, like you said, maybe your whole leg day is only 12 sets. Um, maybe you only have one leg day per week. Maybe you're only training three days per week. It really mm -hmm. depends. Um, in focusing more on hinging patterns, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and squatting patterns. But I think if you're in that former group, even if you are a novice and you're looking to develop everything, it, it ultimately comes down to you want to put some type of tension stimulus, even if it's a very low volume, you know, on, on all, all the muscles that you're trying to grow, which if it's all muscles, then yeah, the anatomical constraints of these exercises is still relevant. You might do something like three sets of a squat pattern, three sets of a hinge pattern, and then just, you know, two sets of a leg extension or two sets of a leg curl and alternate every week. It could be that, that little, and that it'd still be a, a plenty sufficient stimulus um, to, to create some hypertrophy over time uh, and, and, and more align with the goals of that person while not having them do really way more than is needed or optimal at that stage of their development. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Thinking about kind of the trajectory of where they want to take their training career, right? Where if you're always going to be, you know, a twice a week, you know, uh, recreational athlete, then you probably just want to go for the jugular and just grab your, your big gold bars on the big movements first. But if you know that eventually you want to have that complete development, then you should be thinking ahead. In terms of some technique tips on specific exercises, we covered, you know, the squat, bench, and deadlift in our previous episodes. You guys can check that out for all the juice on that. But in terms of a couple of questions I often get asked for a Smith machine, people ask about, you know, optimal foot placement and also kind of the angle of the Smith where, you know, you have Smith machines that are angled to one side and how that affects quadricep development. Yeah, I generally like to be in a position where I'm leaning back into the pad a little bit um, so that when I squat, I can stay more upright on the Smith. So I'm not necessarily trying to replicate a barbell squat with the mm. Smith, mm -hmm. but rather I'm trying to replicate something that feels a little more like a hack squat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because because, you know, if you're trying to replicate a barbell squat, why aren't you just doing a barbell squat? You know, yeah. the, the, the benefit of a Smith machine Potentially, like, like, you know, there's downsides to this as well, is that it requires less stabilization. You can focus more on uh, trying to train specific muscles rather than doing a movement. Um, generally, when you're doing compound free weight exercises, I recommend having sound performance uh, and focusing on as, as a movement task rather than specific muscle groups getting recruited because it's a complex movement that requires coordination of a lot of muscles. And it just doesn't make sense to be like, oh, I'm really focusing on my pecs and a bench press, you know? Um, but you know, when you get to a machine chest press and even, even more so when you get to like a cable crossover, now all of a sudden you can have that more internal focus. And the same thing applies to some degree to squats. So when you move from a barbell squat to a Smith machine squat, to a leg press, to a hack squat, or even to like a, you know, elevated rear foot, single leg split squat or bulk and split squat the more you have uh, the fewer degrees of freedom you have the more constrained the movement uh, the more you can think about which muscles are being trained and how you might alter your performance and your foot placement so generally the reason i like to have the feet forward a little bit maybe even have an elevated heel on a smith machine squat is you can stay more upright so it doesn't require you to think about bracing quite as much it doesn't require you to think about how do i stay upright um, you know, for certain limb length and torso length proportion people uh, with joint, joint uh, range of motion limitations, either around the ankle or the hip, a barbell squat is very challenging to get a decent range of motion about the knee without having hip or lower back discomfort. So a great alternative in these cases is to shift to a hack squat or a Smith machine squat and create something where they can squat a little more like that, you know, that Chinese weightlifter we wish we all were, right? <laughs> um, and stay nice and upright, get more range about the knee, and then theoretically, you know, get a better stimulus and put the quadricep on more stretch, right? Which we're starting to understand, you know, getting it in that lengthened position is, is probably going to create a better stimulus. So that's, that's kind of the benefit. Um, and you can facilitate that through heel lifts and through utilizing the equipment in such a way that allows you to stay a little more upright. Yeah, yeah, that's a 
excellent point about using using your machines to your advantage, right? And allowing that machine to give you some options that you might not have with a free weight. And, you know, particularly with squats, especially if you're going heavy, you don't want to be fiddling around with lots of little weird tweaks to try and get more range of motion. Mm -hmm. For lunges and other single leg variations, do you have any other tips to improve, you know, the stimulation for the quads? Yeah, so I think um, basically the way you think about this is, is the, the more narrow the step you take, the more you're going to have your knee go in front of your toe, uh, the more you're going to have range of motion about the knee, um, and the more it'll be a little more quote unquote quad dominant. And then the, the wider position, the more you're going to put the kind of the glute on stretch, and you're going to be doing a little more hip extension to move in and out of the lunge. But the thing with lunges is they are a compound free weight movement, you know? So a lot of the times your ability to step narrowly or wide is going to be based upon just what feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the time stepping really narrow, it requires a whole lot of dorsiflexion range of motion. And then depending upon your, your limb proportions, sometimes you're going to find yourself like really bending over your, uh, your, your leg and trying to keep your back straight to more challenging. Um, so a lot of people find that they just can't really leverage that same theoretical concept of, you know, narrow lunge for quads, you know, uh, wide lunge for, for glutes, like it works on paper, but they find there's actually a narrower confine of how far they can step without it feeling you know, uncomfortable. I personally am not a huge fan of lunges um, mm. for bodybuilding. I know a lot of people really like them and there's videos yeah. of Ronnie Coleman doing barbell lunges with 225 out in the parking lot. And yeah, that's parking badass. Lot lunges. Yeah, yes. buddy. 100% lightweight, baby. And lunges are hard and you get an intense, you know, set of doms and the glutes. And I do think they are a pretty good glute exercise. Don't get me wrong. But I find that they are very cardiovascularly limiting mm. mm -hmm. because you have to do like you're only training one leg at a time, sort of. But really, it's both legs um, and they are quite tiring. And if you're trying to get a, you know, 10 reps, that kind of means 20 steps, you know. Um, so it ends up being twice as many reps in terms of the cardiovascular output per set than you would otherwise do. So they can really put you in the hole in terms of the fatigue you generate acutely in, in a given exercise, uh, both in terms of like the, the, the local, like feeling of the burn as well as like the cardiovascular fatigue. And I find that they really inflate your rest periods. They make everything else quite hard. Um, so they're, 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 they're fine. Um, but I typically prefer something like a split squat, um, you know, playing around with elevating your heel or putting your foot higher or further back and seeing where can I really sit into, uh, you know, kind of a deep squat. But post COVID, nobody wants to do split squats because many people were stuck at home for a year and a half doing, you know, yeah. whatever kettlebell they had or dumbbell they had split squats. So now I don't like to abuse people with that PTSD, but I generally prefer split squats. Uh, and playing around with the stance position, foot elevation, how far back is your leg, you know, do you elevate your heel, et cetera. Like some people get these these wedges um, and they'll they'll put that over their front foot so they can stay like really nice and upright while doing a split squat and, and really have it be more more quad focused. I think that's generally a preferable choice to lunges in my experience, just because of those same factors I mentioned. Yeah, what's your favorite split squat setup personally? Personally, what I like is um, I find, uh, you know, it'd be like the decline sit-ups that they have in commercial gyms. Mm. And they typically have the pad that uh, that actually rotates a little bit. I set up that height to, to where it is for me. And then I put that on the front of my back ankle so that it rotates as I come down uh, instead of just putting my foot on a bench. And I find that really allows me to, to squat nice and deep. And then sometimes... Um, I will even elevate my front foot so that the floor is further away so I can really drive my knee towards the ground. So I might put my front foot on a, a short aerobic block. I'll hold mm -hmm. dumbbells and I'll put my back leg on the rotating pad of the decline sit-up. Or you can also do that on some machines. Like you can go to a leg extension machine or a, a, a leg curl machine and you can put your like your shoelaces of your back foot on top of the the pad that is typically used and it you know has some rotational capability uh, and that's normally quite comfortable and I, I do it like that but um most of the time personally i don't do a lot of 
unilateral legwork, um, even though I do think it's a good idea. I just don't find that I have much of an issue with bilateral. I don't have one leg that is more or less developed or coordinated or strong or weak than the other. Um, so a lot of my leg training is like leg press, hack squat, and then uh, back squats and leg extensions um, on the quad side of things. Yeah, interesting perspective. Like it's, yeah, it's good to hear that you, you know, don't put lunges on a pedestal, right? Where I've always found that to be the same where they're so exhausting. And I just found myself steering away from them when I started out. And that, you know, for a bodybuilder, especially depending on their experience level, as you become more experienced, the fatigue starts to become a big issue. And you do want to be careful about how much you're burning yourself out. Mm -hmm. Early on, I think a lot of people to kind of take the shotgun approach to legs. Like I remember some leg days being, I would start with a squat or a deadlift, and then I would go to a hack squat or a leg press. Uh, then I would go to a lunge and then I would do either leg extension or leg curl. And those were my two leg days and mm -hmm. then finish with standing calf raises on one day and seated calf raises on the other day. Um, and that's like everything, you know, it's, and yeah. that's, it's fine. Uh, but those days are, I think being more targeted with your efforts and thinking about things a little more tactically and what fits together well and what won't compromise the performance of other movements, what's a little redundant. Um, and, uh, you know, what is something that is the most sustainable from like a, you know, pain and discomfort perspective and what can I really stack my chips on? Like, what can I drive volume up on? What can I go closer to failure with over time? Which exercises are good vehicles for overload, um, for the muscle, not just for like it feeling hard. And for me, like you, maybe it's because I'm six feet tall. Lunges are a great vehicle for just feeling trashed, but not mm -hmm. necessarily, being complimentary in all those ways it's not a bad exercise no such thing as a bad exercise right um but i think you just have to look a little look at things a little differently and not go like okay all the ifb pros include lunges in the training like okay like first that's actually not true some of the very popular ones have and iconic ones have but but is that really you know the, the key piece or is that just something that they happened to do you know so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and I like what you said about, you know, just because something makes you feel tired or trash doesn't necessarily mean it's better, right? Where people are judge the quality of their leg training by how exhausted and like passed out on the floor am I? And, mm -hmm. you know, just because something causes a lot of cardiometabolic burn, you know, you can't conflate that necessarily with hypertrophic stimulus. Well said. Okay. And then going on to a couple things about machines. For leg presses and hack squats, any thoughts on the foot placement where people might talk about, you know, trying to place the feet lower down for leg press for more quad emphasis? Yeah, actually, let's start with the back pad positioning on leg press, because this is often overlooked. Hmm. Not all machines enable you to adjust it, and the machines that do enable you to adjust it, people often don't think about it and just leave it on whatever setting it was there. But ideally, you want to lean that back pad back as much as you can on a 45 degree angle like plate loaded leg press so that you're in less hip flexion because you'll find that your asis or just your body will get in the way and the more you're in hip flexion the more it requires you to have more dorsiflexion and more range of motion about the knee so if you can actually lean back if you think about it like if you kind of invert your your perspective and you look at it like okay i'm doing a squat instead of a leg press like if you kind of took that 45 degree angle and shifted it the other way the more that back pad is up, it's like squatting, being really bent over like a good morning. Mm -hmm. And the more good morning your squat is, the more challenging it is to get into that deep knee flexion position, right? So in an ideal world, what you do is you put that seat as far back as you can, reduce the amount of hip flexion you're in, and then you put your heels lower on the pad so that as you're coming down, you get more rotation about the knee. And once you remove the amount of hip flexion that is at the at, uh, uh, by adjusting the back pad position, then kind of the limiter for what enables you to get more range about the knee is going to be your dorsiflexion range. So how much ankle mobility do you have? Um, so I think people sometimes don't warm up enough on the leg press. I really like to put my feet close to the bottom and just do reps until my heels like not coming off of the bottom. And I'm trying to get as much range as I can and slowly put plates on there and just kind of use that as a, like an active stretch. I also think that people don't think about their footwear very much when they're on leg press typically because 
they're not standing on the ground. They don't have to worry about balance. Uh, it's not like a squat, but having an elevated heel can be really helpful on a leg press as well, because you can get a few more degrees of range about the ankle, and then you can get more range about the knee and get that quad into a more stretched position. Um, you may also need to play with your foot position to, you know, like if you uh, externally rotate your feet a little bit, you can sometimes get your, your hips out of the way of your quads and you can get a little deeper. Um, I, I, I like to do that. Just basically finding the position that allows the most, the most depth on a leg press without you finding that it's like making you curl up in your lower back. Um, cause not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but we're trying to get more range about the knee. Right. So, mm -hmm. Um, I find myself with a low foot position, wearing a heel, uh, feet turned out about 45 degrees in like a roughly shoulder width position on the pad. Again, you know, your hip structure, your mileage may vary. And then putting the seat as far down as I can so I'm in less hip flexion. Um, and it's going to look different for everybody, but basically trying to figure out how do I get the most depth on a leg press rather than stacking more plates, putting your feet high and just, you know, doing a partial range. Um, and for the people who are like, oh, I want to put my feet high and make it more glute focused, to be honest, I just don't think the leg press is a great vehicle for doing, you know, hip extension and getting more mm -hmm. glute focused. Um, it, it's definitely there. You are extending your hip. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the range isn't great compared to what you can get about the knee. So if you're looking for a good glute exercise, choose something else rather than, uh, you know, putting your feet high on a leg press, in my opinion. Yeah, those are great advanced tips. You know, I think, yeah, people don't think about the the back pad and, you know, the shoes. So some things for people to try out. Moving on to ha hamstrings. I think this will be also very interesting where, you know, that a lot of people have a lot of kind of misconceptions about training them. How would you start, you know, in terms of your favorite compounds? Yeah, I think we can start with kind of that similar perception to the squat being the king of exercises. You will sometimes hear people say the deadlift is. Um, and the deadlifts, deadlifts have an interesting place in bodybuilding culture uh, mm -hmm. because as soon as bodybuilders started to think about body part splits and they got away from like full body training or it was less crossed over with uh, strength training where you know, deadlifts were just an exercise you trained for general size and strength and you didn't worry about it too much and you did supplementary exercises to train specific muscle groups. Once we started to have back days and leg days, the the silly bro question that would break the brains of, of many a bodybuilder was, do I put deadlifts on back day or leg day? Oh, um, no. So <laughs> Not hard. that question. Yeah. Um, and the, the simple answer is they obviously train both. <laughs> um, but you get some funny things. Once you categorize deadlifts as a back exercise, you'll have some people think that it's good for lat development or rhomboid development or trap development. And they don't really understand why or how. Um, and obviously you do use your back to do a deadlift, right? You do, to finish the, the rep, you have to be in, you know, uh, scapular retraction uh, and uh, spinal extension, right? Um, and also to some degree, the lats are involved, you know, but they're never lengthened, you know, a lot of these muscles. Um, so while they are working very hard to, to complete that rep, they're probably not getting a great stimulus from a hypertrophy perspective. You're probably generating a lot of strength from the angles that occur at those joints, uh, you know, the shoulder and, and each one of the articulated, you know, spinal joints in the back when you're doing a deadlift. Um, but I would say the, the main muscle group that's getting trained from the deadlift that's in the back is your erectors. The same thing could be, could be said that's true of a squat, right? So um, the deadlift from a bodybuilding perspective is probably best categorized under the hinge. Uh, and the hinge is where there's a very small degree of knee extension, although it's still occurring. You know, if you watch someone do a conventional deadlift or a similar deadlift, they do go through knee extension. Mm -hmm. But it's a small enough component to the exercise that now we are actually seeing hip extension involving the hamstrings and the glutes. When we look at research on this, we don't have a ton of research on like, uh, you know, hamstring development in response to deadlifts, but we do have some or deadlift variations. And uh, it's definitely a reasonable thing to say that deadlifts are training the lower back, the glutes and the hamstrings, right? Mm -hmm. So 
Now you might be, you know, thinking, awesome, that sorts out everything I got that I missed from squats. Well, not not exactly. If we kind of recap, rectus femoris still untrained, and the hamstrings, yes, they are hip extensors and knee flexors. And now that we've reduced how much knee extension you're doing, moving from a squat to a deadlift, the hamstrings are getting trained. However, the short head of the bicep femoris, one of the hamstring muscles, a specific division of the bicep femoris, it only crosses the knee. So kind of the lower portion of your hammy is just a knee flexor. So now we're starting to see why we can't just stick to compounds if our goal is, you know, complete proportionate development and someone that really does kind of have that, that category of goals that are, you know, aesthetic in nature or more bodybuilding in nature. So hinges are great. Um, between hinges and squats, most competitors get all the glute training they need. And it might only be specific divisions like, say, the bikini division or, or specific people who tend to have attachments or just a genetic predisposition to not growing their glutes very effectively who might need additional work there. Um, between squats and deadlifts, glutes are taken care of. Um, the majority of the hamstrings are, but we're still missing out on the, uh, the short head of the biceps femoris. So now we've seen that through these two main compound exercises, there are some gaps where you might want to do isolated knee extension and isolated knee flexion. So hinges are great. Um, thinking about which hinges are best, I would refer people to the episode we did on the squat bench and the deadlift and why I think that your typical conventional or sumo deadlift are not the perfect vehicle if your main goal is hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to exert control over the eccentric when you're going heavy. Um, and something where you start at the top, like an RDL, uh, forces you to exert control over the eccentric, so you're getting all the volume you think you are. It also trains the muscle, at the hamstrings specifically, actually the glutes as well, at a longer muscle length because you're keeping your hips a little higher and you're bending over at the waist. So, you know, on paper, while, you know, you're absolutely training the glutes and hams in a hinge, some hinges are probably better than others. Things like a good morning or an RDL um, are, are probably getting you into a more stretched position, similarly akin to manipulating squats so that you can get into a deep position. And I mean, squat patterns, not necessarily barbell squats. So yeah, I think, um, good mornings and RDLs are, are probably, if someone comes to me with pure bodybuilding goals, those are typically going to be my first go-to rather than a sumo or a conventional deadlift, unless they also have strength goals. Well, they just really love those exercises. And when someone does really love those exercises or they have strength goals, when our main focus of a given training session or block or week is hypertrophy, I make sure to give them the cue of, hey, let's control the eccentric on each one of these reps because, you know, that's going to be a substantial portion of the uh, of the stimulus that we get. And we don't want to just kind of let gravity do that for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I think that a lot of people, you know, start off thinking that squat, bench and deadlift is going to take care of them for everything. And, you know, you realize that there's lots more nuance in terms of particularly trying to get that stretch and the quality of your stimulus to the amount of fatigue that you're incurring as well. 100%. In terms of leg curls, what are your thoughts on lying versus seated leg curls? You know, the, 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 the typical default position that people have, it depends on what they've been exposed to in terms of knowledge. Like um, seated leg curls are just a pain in the ass to set up. I don't mean that as a pun, but um, <laughs> there's like five Still things you can adjust. You know, how, how, how far the seat goes back and forth, where the pad on top of your, your knee goes, where the pad under your ankle goes, right? Um, and with the lying leg curl, it's really just one adjustment point. So, and it's easier, you get to lie down. Um, so most people just, if they've just been to a gym, if you ask them, would you prefer a seated or a lying leg curl, they tell you lying. And that's just because it's more comfortable and you feel like you can focus on the hamstring a little bit more. However, if you've been exposed to data on tra training in a longer uh, muscle length uh, and doing training, like comparing a seated leg curl to a lying leg curl, you might now prefer the lying leg curl because we have data showing that a seated leg curl produces more hypertrophy in the hamstrings muscle group. And if that's a surprise to you, um, A, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, and B, you're probably wondering, well, why? And well, essentially, a seated leg curl puts you into more of a stretch position for the hamstring. If you think about it, you're almost doing like a sit and reach test while you're training. So you're getting a stretch on the hamstring and that provides what we think an additional stimulus, additional tension stimulus. 
um, and that ends up producing more hypertrophy. Now, the next level, we've got kind of this evolving brain, you know, the meme where eventually you become enlightened and it blows exploding up. Exploding brain meme. See, exactly, see the whole universe, is understanding that um, there's more knee flexors than are just represented in the hamstring group. So the hamstrings are on the back of your thigh, um, but we also have the sartorius, which is a strap-like muscle that starts on the anterior portion and originates from the front of your, your hips and then it wraps around your leg and then it connects kind of medially down your knee. So it is both a knee flexor and a hip flexor, right? So you got a lot of cool muscles in the body and it actually looks really cool in, uh, in front shots if you know how to pose it. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of that delineation between your adductor and your, uh, your teardrop and it, it really adds a lot to the appearance of having muscular detailed legs. So you do want to develop your sartorius now the thing is, though, since it attaches at the front of your, your hip and it is a hip flexor and knee flexor, that means it is actually more stretched when you're doing lying hamstring curls. So mm. that is something that a lot of people don't necessarily consider. They're thinking, I'm doing leg curls, like I said, as hamstring curls. But when you're doing knee flexion, which is really what we're talking about, you're training all the knee flexors and not all the knee flexors are part of the hamstrings. So there is a time and a place to include some lying hamstring curls because that is a more effective way of training the sartorius. And in a study by Mao and colleagues where they actually compared seated hamstring curls to lying hamstring curls, that's exactly what they found is that the hamstring group grew better in response to seated hamstring curls, which stretched the hamstring group more. However, lying hamstring curls produced more hypertrophy on the sartorius, which is stretched more when your body is straight uh, and your knee is and your hip is not flexed. So probably an argument to do both. Um, not everyone necessarily has access to both, but, it, and, and it's not like, what, like the hamstrings are not growing at all when you're doing lying hamstring curls. And it's not like the sartorius is not growing at all when you're doing seated hamstring curls. It's just one is slightly more efficient than the other because it puts the muscle group on a little more stretch. So I think that we shouldn't conflate um, being better for as working or not working, which we often, unfortunately do in the fitness industry. So it's really not the end of the world if you just don't have access to one of these machines and you're just doing the curl that you can. The cards you were dealt, it's probably fine. Um, but I think if we were talking about optimizing things for people with high level physique goals, ideally you'd probably do both seated and lying. Yeah, that was great. Mind blown. So I remember learning about the Sartorius in med school. It's like basically to think about the function, it's like putting your leg up on your knee. Um, I remember thinking to myself, how could I invent a sartorius curl? You know, like if I just attached a little weight to my ankle. Bro, what you need is this really sticky gum that you step on. And then you're like trying to look at the gum on your shoe. It's basically the I stepped in dog poo muscle. Like, oh, crap. You know, and then you lift your heel up and you look down at it. You know, and that's actually a posing cue I would use sometimes is like, imagine you're trying to like, yeah, pick up a stick with your foot and then show your, your heel to yourself, but, but keep your foot stationary. So it's like an isometric thinking about looking at dog poo on my foot or, or looking at gum on my shoe kind of thing. <laughs> These are the unique skill sets we have as bodybuilders. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Going on to glutes. So this is going to be of interest, I'm sure to actually briefly, can we talk yeah. about knee extension? So isolated knee extension machines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, here's another example of something that people don't typically have access to, but I think is kind of a good exercise. Um, your 99% of knee extension machines you're going to run into force you to be in a seated position. And just like the seated leg curl versus lying leg curl situation, if you could lie back on that leg extension machine, you would actually put the rectus femoris because again, it attaches at the, the top of the hip and it is a mm. hip flexor and a knee, knee extensor. You could put it on more stretch. So one of the options that you can do, there's typically two that you will actually see this is one, some of the home gym plate loaded uh, leg extension, leg curl dual machines. Mm -hmm. You can set the lower part up for a knee extension, but you can lie back and then you can do a plate loaded lying leg extension um, if you have a home gym. If you don't have that and you're curious, well, how can I do a more stretched position knee extension? What you can do is go to a cable stack, put a cuff around your ankle, set the uh, attachment up around hip height and have the cable uh, attached to the cuff on your ankle with the you know D ring facing backwards, so it's 
you know, on, on the side of your ankle where your heel is. And then you can do a standing leg extension uh, to where your body is straight, one leg is up, one leg's down, and you're holding the other side of the cable stack for stability, and you're just doing a leg extension into the ground with one leg at a time. It takes longer, it's more pain in the ass to set up, um, but it is probably a better exercise for the rectus femoris because it puts you in a more stretched position. Um, and that's also a very useful thing for a home gym where you're thinking, oh, how do I do a leg extension if I don't have a leg extension machine? If you have a cable stack where you can adjust the cable, um, you can do it. And that's actually how I do leg extensions at home. Yeah, that's that's innovative. I like it. People are going to have massive rectus femoruses and sartoriuses or up. sartorii. I don't know how you say the plural. I, I, I never get put, put in a position to do that. They'll show my ignorance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, so glutes. Um, glutes. Yeah, this is one where, you know, sometimes gets debated where people are like, let's say we're talking about someone who has a general physique development goal. What is the necessity of, you know, direct glute training, like hip thrusting? Yeah, I think, you know, hip thrust or glute bridges are useful because you're trying to isolate the action of hip extension. Um, kind of in the same way that like a back extension, 45 degree angle back extension is useful. And I think if kind of going back to my previous caveat, if you've got your hip, your hinging pattern, and if you've got your squatting pattern and you are not getting the glute development, uh, out of that, that you think you otherwise would have, uh, or would, would want, um, or would benefit from, then it might be worthwhile throwing in some of these other movements. Um, I find actually some of the, my favorite ones that I've had a, had a play with are like some of the, the the hip extension machines. They're not out there that much, but sometimes you can find them plate loaded or cable based or just kind of the setup where it makes it a little easier to do a barbell hip extension. Mm. But I find like barbell hip extensions without a machine or glute bridges are a huge pain in the ass to set up. They don't allow much range. Um, and when you overload, if you feel like you're losing range, so I, I don't find that it's very easy to train the glutes at a long muscle length and really produce some, some, you know, some good overload there. I've seen certain people argue that maybe it doesn't matter or they're a unique muscle where they don't need to be trained to long muscle length, but I don't think the current data, we now actually have four studies that I'm aware of on training at longer muscle lengths that all seem to have similar findings showing that, hey, this is probably good. Um, and uh, so my, my kind of default position is you want to try to find exercises that do produce overload in the lengthened position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I had to guess, if I was to go head to head, uh, you know, hip thrust versus RDL, I'd probably bet on the RDL for producing mm -hmm. more, um, more, more, more glute development. So, yeah, I would say absolutely throw them in there if, if the, the hinge and the squat patterns aren't doing the job for you. Um, but... If you don't have access to a hip thrust, don't think that you're missing out on something. Despite how popular they've become, especially in the bikini division, I think other options like pull-throughs uh, and 45-degree back extensions are are great. Um, mm -hmm. Those both enable you to get a pretty pretty strong stimulus and and stimulate the uh, the glutes in in a lengthened position. Not necessarily, you know, the highest stress is not necessarily when they're in the lengthened position. Some of these exercises, but um, they are still pretty damn good options. I mean, the hip thrust isn't necessarily that way either. It's hard to the top, uh, and just like the 45 degree back extension. So something like a pull through, I think is quite good. That's an underrated exercise. It's hard to set up typically. <laughs> um, another one I actually like is putting on a dip belt, attaching it to a cable stack, walking forward, grabbing something ahead of you and doing a standing cable hip thrust. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are a really good movement. You just need some grippy shoes, and um, and those are those are quite effective. Um, so you can you can even use like um, some of the cable handles, like the, the the canvas handles that you can attach to a cable stack. Wrap those around like an upright on a squat rack if it's close enough to the cable stack. Walk yourself forward and then kind of hold those handles while you hip thrust forward. So a standing hip thrust basically with cables. I think that's a pretty damn good movement. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, like I said, and I'm not, I'm not saying that hip thrusts with a barbell or uh, glute bridges with a barbell aren't good. It's just that 
they're, they're just a pain in the ass, no pun intended. And they don't always necessarily allow the range that some of these other options like a pull through or a standing cable hip extension or a back extension allow. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I've done a lot of you know, hip thrust in the past, especially because we used to use them a lot for track. But yeah, like they're a lot of trouble to set up. You have to lug all these plates over, especially because you are quite strong in that movement. So mm -hmm. you have to load all these plates on and then um, it's it's not the most the most stable movement or the best you know range of motion either so yeah i like that idea about the standing hip thrust with a dips belt just yeah don't make eye contact with anyone while you're doing it <laughs> yeah exactly you're not trying to get kicked out of the gym um <laughs> it's also nice uh being serious from from the perspective of not needing some like rolled up yoga pad to protect your your hip bones when you're getting mm -hmm. strong on these exercises but then at the same time, when you get strong on a, on a cable hip thrust, you typically run out of stack pretty quick. And then even if you could get enough weight on the stack, then it's so heavy that you can't even like walk out and you need to like have someone tug of war you into position so you can, you know, then hold on. So getting strong on isolated hip extension movements does create its own set of problems. Um, so, but again, generally, I think it's actually the, the minority of people who really need more than hinges and squats to develop their glutes mm. so yeah, especially if they're also doing single leg work you know uh, like lunges and split squats yeah yeah glad we set that to rest because yeah and particularly with things like lunges and bulgarian split squats and those types of movements put, a, put your glutes on a big stretch as well mm -hmm. which i really like one thing i do like there are some pretty good machines out there for training the glutes that are not hip thrust variants so um there are a few they're not super common but i've seen a number of them where they're like the multi-hip uh machine or they're an isolated machine where you basically do one leg on a pad and you do like a a, a kickback so mm -hmm. like a uh, a glute kickback machine i really like those especially if you can adjust it so that your starting position is like your knees up in your chest so you're getting that glute in a nice stretch position and then you can extend all the way back and you know pushing through the heel stabilizing um, those are great machines and they kind of solve a lot of those problems that we're trying to get at with back extensions hip thrusts pull throughs because uh, then you can load it up and you can uh, isolate you know hip extension there is also knee extension there which is which is probably fine you know it's, it's sort of the squat pattern but it really is emphasizing a more stretched position on the glute um, and it enables you to focus more on the glute with you know so many fewer degrees of freedom so yeah, if you can find a good, um, you can replicate this with like a, a cable kickback, but it's just far less stable. And if you go heavy enough, then you can't quite do it. So like some of the glute machines I actually really like. Yeah, that, that's actually a great point because the power of these machines is, as you said, you get the stability and they were designed for strong muscles, right? Mm -hmm. Where this is one thing where the glutes I find are tricky in that kind of sense because they are a very strong muscle group and if you try and overload like a cable kickback and you're actually strong then that's going to pose a lot of issues just from instability 100 percent. for someone who say has glute you know focused uh intent like say bikini competitor or such what's the importance of abduction exercises yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to include some abduction exercises. I always say AB and adduction because adduction and abduction on a podcast sound very similar, so don't make fun of me. So abduction, um, you know, your leg moving out to the side of you, like that's not a bad thing to include. Um, I don't think it should be seen as a staple or a, or a must um, because a lot of the muscles that are actually involved doing that are also involved in hip extension. Um, but it's certainly something that you could use as a supplementary exercise. I'm thinking, like, if I had a bikini competitor work with me, I would probably try to include that. We could use them one of the machines, like the the good old any Audi machine, or we could just simply do uh, like a cable, um, you know, kind of cross body uh, abduction exercise. But it's certainly not one of my staples that I think is, um, you know, a must for people for 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 glute development. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. So yeah, coming off of those big muscle groups, going on to the calves. This is yes, going to be a juicy one, you know, which we'll find out about in a bit. Yep. 
So calves, there's a, uh, a recent study that came out by Cassiano and colleagues where they uh, had people doing calf raises on a, a horizontal pin loaded leg press. And the three different groups were doing two different or different ranges of motion. They had the full range group. They had the group that was doing the initial half of the movement. So basically going from a dorsiflex position to their foot at neutral. And they had a group that was doing like, so that's the initial range of motion group, the full range, initial range, and then the final group was the final range of motion group. And they went from like a neutral calf, so not going into dorsiflexion, and then just plantar flexing. So they had like the last half of the range of motion. And they had some pretty impressive results where you saw like a 15% increase in muscle thickness. These are untrained women. Um, in the gastric gastrocnemius, both like the medial and lateral portion of it, uh, in the initial range of motion group, and it was more like seven, eight percent in the full range of motion group, so half of that in the in the initial. And then it was only like three or four percent in the final range group. Mm -hmm. So this is a, another study that's recently come out, really showing that that lengthened position training is quite important. And actually, if you're spending all of your time and all your effort in that lengthened range, it might even be better than the full range of motion training, which is pretty wild. Yeah. Wow. Um, now this might be specific to the calves. That's possible. You know, they're a quote unquote stubborn muscle group and um, they are definitely uh, with this specific exercise challenged in that lengthened position quite a lot. So, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to say that all we should be doing is is partial range, yeah. uh, uh, you know, length, long muscle length partials and nothing else. Um, but it is, uh, you know, interesting information and I want to see more come out here. Bit of a side tangent, but. Um, essentially, the most important thing with calves is getting that full range of motion, training in that lengthened bottom position, not just kind of staying nice and high, even though you might feel a little more of a burn because you're kind of staying in that contracted state. Uh, and I think it's also important um, to find an exercise that fits your foot well. Like most people I find, they find their feet slipping and they, they can't find a good way to, to, to stay in the right spot. Um, and they feel like they also, another common thing is they have, they feel like they must do seated calf raises and standing calf raises because mm -hmm. yeah, they got to do seated so that it makes it harder for the gastroc to work so the soleus can work. But the soleus is a mono, mono articular muscle. It's just crossing the ankle. So it's always working, you know, like if you're doing a standing calf raise, the soleus and the gastroc are both contributing. And I don't know why the specific muscle group of the calves, people feel like they have to try to you know, isolate the, the two muscle groups, you know, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't do that with a lot of the other muscle groups. Like we're, um, we're happy to let compounds that effectively train both muscle groups do their job. And I, um, I personally, I bought into this for years and I even tried to do like high rep stuff for the seated calf raises because the soleus are generally more fast <laughs> twitch or slow twitch and the mm -hmm. gastrox more fast twitch. And I, I never saw a difference. And I don't think the, uh, the data or the rationale really bears fruit on that front. So I think, you know, feel free to do a seated calf raise if you want, but it's probably just less efficient than doing, you know, less bent knee calf raises. Um, so find what works really well. It's an isolation movement. If you find your feet will stay stable on a leg press calf raise, great. If you find that doesn't work very well and it's better to do a, you know, a standing calf raise machine, do that. Um, and don't be afraid to just find a step and do single leg body weight. Most people, depending upon their body size, aren't getting more than 15 reps on something like that, especially if they're going all the way down, briefly pausing at the bottom. So you can you can do a lot with just a straight up standing calf raise. Um, and just most important things are make sure you train at the bottom, don't bounce. Um, that tendon that attaches the calcaneus is, is super long, super bouncy and springy. It's a, it's a quote unquote jumping muscle, if you will. So I think providing a little bit of a pause at the bottom, letting it dis dissipate and making sure that uh, it is the the muscle that is primarily producing uh, that force and not some of the passive uh, force producing components of the muscle tendon unit is, is important. So full range, brief pause at the bottom, come up at least through the, the, the length the and length partial range. Full range is probably also quite good. I'm not ready to bet the farm on Cassiano, but, um, but yeah, and probably no need to think about fiber type composition or needing to do seated versus standing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating about the 
data on you know the different ranges of motion and particularly so because i remember this came up on a podcast episode between us like a year ago when mm -hmm. we were talking about partials and how there wasn't really much evidence but it's just it's an exciting time you know to be in this field where we're seeing all this stuff just starting to come out and and it ultimately will affect our practice as bodybuilders and coaches so i think that's cool absolutely what's been going on with your personal stretching study on calves yeah, so we're analyzing it, working on it. Um, the overall finding was that it did make a small difference in my calf size, so it does mm -hmm. work. And uh, I think the cool application there is that just simply stretching is probably a sufficient stimulus. You probably want to do it after training or on off days. There's also data to suggest that it, it does also produce muscle damage, like it is a tension stimulus. Um, so, like for example, if you're traveling and you can't get access to a gym, Holding a 10 to 15 minute pretty severe stretch for like your quad, hamstring, uh, glute, and calf, that will probably uh, act as a stimulus, even if wow. you can't get to the gym. Yeah, just just you know, let's say you're you're away for a week, you don't have gym access, and you you're like, oh, I'm missing a leg day. Yeah, do a do a hardcore stretching session on your 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 quad, hammy, calf. That's something that. Um, is in my back pocket when I travel now, which is pretty cool. And I think you could even add it on to uh, to your current stretching. Now, I will say most of the data we have is in the calves, and it's mostly by one uh, research group led by uh, Warnicke and colleagues. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, German last name. Apologies if, if I'm not. But um, but the data is pretty damn consistent, and I don't have any reason to think it's incorrect. So, you know, more research needs to be done there. But yeah, stretching is a hypertrophy stimulus to the best knowledge we have in humans. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, wow. Awesome stuff. And then one last thing I wanted to tack on was adductors. You already touched on these before, but um, is direct training necessary? I think if you're doing deep squats, probably not. Um, but you certainly can inc include it. For whatever reason, though, if you haven't done these in a while and you decide to go on the any outing machine and do like just three sets of a hard three hard sets of ten on like you know uh, uh, a a deduction, um, expect to be super sore if you don't do them regularly. So just just be aware of that. And if you're going to start to add in direct adductor work, which I think you only really need to do if like your your overall leg size is, looks like it's lacking, you could try to add a little more stimulus to the adductor, especially if you're not doing a whole lot of squats. Um, you could do some adductor training and yeah, like your first time doing it, just do like two sets to like a six RPE and then you can get into the next week or you're going to have like doms and your adductors that message you up on both hinges and squats for, mm -hmm. for a good, good week or two. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So yeah, that wraps up a solid little talk and hopefully that gives you guys a leg up with your training. Uh, just to close out, I wanted to just touch base with you in terms of prep. How are things going, man? They're good. Yeah. So I um I was I've been prepping now for geez, it's eleventh of April. So it's been on just about two months. Um I'm in the 88th right now as we speak. Here it's eleventh of April. There in Canada, it's the tenth of April. Um and so that's probably like eight kilos, nine kilos over stage weight for me. Mm -hmm. So uh I've lost I had a bloated highway in a 96, but I very quickly dropped. So I've, I've dropped about, uh, you know, eight kilos and I've got probably another eight kilos to lose. So I'm at the 50%, you know, the easy kind of first drop off. I'm yeah. probably at like the lower end of my, my intervention point for body fat right now. I, I don't feel dieted. I hadn't been really trying. I'm just not, you know, I just made some replacements and swaps and up my activity a little bit. So yeah, things are looking good. Um, and I'm still on track to potentially do, uh, 83 kilo m1 powerlifting meet in looks like the the comp date got changed to early july so i should have no issue making weight at that point and then first show in september so um to balance that with the travel schedule i'm going to mexico in like three days with alberto nunez we're going to do some presentations on bodybuilding prep there so it'll be the first time i have my my coach directly take eyes on me and we'll start officially working together i kind of got the easy weight off for him and now he can can deal with the uh, the hard stuff uh, as we can move forward. So I'm looking forward to that, and I'll probably be dropping another update um, either during me being in Mexico, depending on internet speed, or once I get back. So you can expect that in 
third or fourth week of April. I'll have an update on our YouTube channel at 3DMJ. Nice. In terms of your relation to scale weight, at what weight do you start running into, you know, the suck or like the digging phase? Yeah, that's that's changed over time, which is kind of interesting. And I think it has to do with, you know, perceived stress versus actual like physiological lower limits of where I start to get beat up. And um, it doesn't really get hard for me until I'm like 82, 81, 83. So maybe like seven, eight pounds over stage weight. Mm-hmm. That isn't a place I would want to hang out forever, but it's, it's just not that hard with the habits I have in place now. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel totally fine now. Like, I'm not having issues with, with sleep. I don't feel hormonally different. Not that that's, you know, a testosterone test or anything like that. So, yeah, I'm I'm uh, probably four kilos away from, from things starting to feel just bad. So, yeah, give me a couple, two, two to three more months. I think I should be all right. Yeah, awesome. Well, excited to see how things go as this prep evolves. So thanks again for being on the show, Eric. Where can people find you? Well, thank you. No, you can find me at 3dmusclejourney.com. That is the number three, the letter D, musclejourney.com. And from there, you can find links to the 3DMJ podcast, our blog articles, uh, the 3DMJ vault, where we have free and paid courses for people to become better students of the sport, and also links to my books, The Muscle and Strength Pyramids, Uh, monthly research review mass where i'll actually be reviewing the cassiano study that'll come out on the first of may Um, and then if you uh, just love lifting generally from the history to the science to the culture check out my podcast with omar east of iron culture on all podcast platforms and if you want to stay up with me hopping on other people's awesome podcasts like this one right here school radio then make sure to follow me at helms 3dmj on instagram where i share my other podcast appearances Awesome. So I'll link to Eric in the description below. And till next time.